Thanks for joining us in the iAccess STAR training webinar. My name is Laura Parks and I'm an AT specialist here with TASC, which is Technology Assistance for Special Consumers. And we contract with STAR, which is the statewide assistive technology resource, to provide assistive technology trainings throughout the state. Um, we also collaborate with STAR to provide our lending library and it's online at AL atforall.com and you'll see there's lots of the things we'll talk about today you can get through our lending library and check it out for two to three weeks at a time for no fee just mail it back to us um, if that's something you're interested in make sure you visit the website a handout has been provided either through email or below this video feel free to download it um, and if so you can follow along for this presentation this webinar has been registered with ASHA and it's available for point one ASHA CE continuing education under the professional intermediate identification. My name again is Laura Parks. I am an employee of TASC and we contract with STAR to provide assistive technology and I have no finance, other financial or non-financial relationships to disclose. I also did want to let you know that this content presented in this webinar primarily does focus on the iPad, but many of the solutions we're going to talk about will work for other tablet devices such as Androids or Kindle Fires, as well as with some of the dedicated AAC devices. So even though I may say iPad or iPod Touches, remember this may or may not work with other devices. So just a little overview of the webinar. Today we're going to talk about some simple solutions. We're going to talk about some settings that are in iOS 7. Now, hopefully you all know that iOS 8 will be coming out next week. We're not sure what exactly those changes will be as far as accessibility, but hopefully they kept all of the great things that are in iOS 7. We're going to also talk about some cases that can help accessing the iPad be more successful, some styluses, some positioning and mounts for the iPad, some key guards, some switch access, and then finally we will talk briefly about environmental control for the iPad. So that's kind of a little overview of what this training will focus on to help increase the ability to access the iPad. And the reason it's so important to access the iPad is what we're finding is many school systems are choosing to use one-on-one -on -one initiatives in the school system where every student is getting a tablet of some sorts, whether it's an iPad or if it's a um, an Android-based tablet or even like a netbook. And it's important for our students with physical disabilities or visual impairments or hearing impairments that they still have access to that technology. So that's really what we're going to focus on today, improving that access. But for speech therapists, another reason why it's so important is that we want students with physical impairments to be able to access their communication devices. There's all kinds of wonderful communication apps and language apps available on iPads and tablets. But if a student can't physically interact with it, it kind of defeats the purpose. They become passive and are just watching. And we really want our students to be an active participant with their learning and with their communication. So that's why it's really important that we talk about access when we're looking at devices. So let's start with some simple solutions. Now if you've ever taken a training with me or have met me, you know I'm always thinking outside the box and trying to find really simple and easy solutions because I've been in the classroom. I know funding is limited and sometimes we can't buy things that we need, so we kind of have to come up with things that will work for us. So we're just going to talk briefly about some, brief, some simple solutions that may help you. The first thing is a Ziploc bag. Believe it or not, if you slide a tablet into a Ziploc bag, it will still work. I can still touch the screen, make choices, swipe, gestures, and it works, which is great. And this is really important because maybe you've worked with a student that has poor oral motor control and they can't keep their mouth closed when they're re leaning over the iPad and they may drool. Well, the drool may won't really hurt the iPad, but it's embarrassing for the student they try to wipe it up or gets in their way when they're trying to touch. So the Ziploc bag can just help because then it makes it really simple to wipe off the drool or saliva that may get onto the iPad. Also, if you're using the iPad for a communication device, let's say you're doing a messy activity such as cooking. Well, you may have picture symbols showing the steps or you may want to give them a communication board so they can say, ooh, this is gross or oh, I'm wet. Well, you don't want to do that on the iPad and risk it getting dirty or messy. So if you put it in a Ziploc bag, you don't have to worry about that. 
Now they do make waterproof bags that you can purchase for the, the iPads, which might also be an option. I definitely wouldn't take this iPad in a Ziploc bag to places like the swimming pool or the bathtub where it could possibly get immersed underwater. But if you're just worried about a little bit of water, a little bit of Play-Doh or pudding, food, something to get on the bag, the Ziploc bag is a great option. Something we all have access to, real simple, and it's a free solution. Um, in the right-hand picture, you may notice they've actually taken the iPad and they've slid it into a binder, one of those binders that has the front clear cover. Now, that's a little difficult. You have to stretch the cover a little bit, just that same principle, and now they've actually made it on a slant board, which may help with access. So I love that low-tech idea. Now here's another simple solution. This is my colleague Chrissy. She is actually using a beef jerky stick as a stylus. Um, I was, she's demonstrating with an extra long one, so maybe you have a student that doesn't have the ability to use their hands, but they could use their mouth. Now mouth sticks are available. We'll talk briefly about those in a few minutes. But the beef jerky stick does work if you're in a pinch. Um, and it provided a little humor and just to show, hey, did you know if it would work? So in case you don't have a stylus or if you want to try one, the beef jerky stick will work because it's capacitative just like your finger is. Now this idea I truly, truly love. Now if you'll notice in the top right hand, this little light blue glove, there's three fingertips that have silver thread in them. This is what makes those fingertips, fingertips capacitative, meaning when you touch the screen it will work. Because iPads and most modern tablets work not on pressure, how hard you push the screen, but if your finger making an electrical connection. So that's why you can't use gloves when you're using an iPad. So you can buy these specialized gloves during the winter months, or I like to buy mine in spring when they're half price. But you can buy these at a lot of different places where it has three fingertips designed to work with the screen. Well, the problem that I have when I work sometimes with clients is they have poor hand control and their hand rests on the iPad screen. So when they go to touch something, their hand touches and it messes up the screen. It may swap the app. It may do something in the app that they didn't intend to and they get frustrated. But because they don't have enough fine motor control, they can't lift their hand to make it work. So one of my individuals with ALS showed me what he did. He actually gets the cheap pair of gloves. Now here's a little pair of leather ones over here, but here's these cheap little magic gloves you get for about a dollar a pair. And all you have to do is cut the one fingertip off that you want to activate the screen. Now the child or the individual with the motor controls, they can rest their entire hand, their palm on the screen, and only that one fingertip that you cut out will activate the buttons on the screen. So it's a great trick. Even if you're working with a younger child and you're trying to get them to isolate their pointer finger, this would be a great simple solution. So just buy the cheapest glove, 50 cent magic glove from any store and just cut out that one fingertip. Real easy, simple solution. Now believe it or not, the pipe cleaner is another great solu simple solution. You ever worked with a student and you try to show them where to activate the screen and you point at and you go, click right here, point right here, and all you have to do is touch right here. Well, inevitably what happens is you accidentally activate the screen and they don't get the chance to touch it where you wanted them to touch. Well, that's where the pipe cleaner comes in handy. All you do is make a little loop on the pipe cleaner, as you can see in the picture, and now this becomes like, like a magic wand. So wherever you want the student to click, you just put the little pipe cleaner right over the screen and the student knows to push within that spot to activate the button. So instead of you having to point and, not, and worry about touching the screen, the pipe cleaner is not going to activate the screen, so now the students know where to point because they just put their finger in the middle of the pipe cleaner. So I like to call that my magic wand to show students where to point. Really, really great if you're working with a communication app and you're trying to teach a student where a keyword is for motor planning, then you can just use this to let them highlight where they're trying to activate. Now, wiki sticks are something you may not have, never have heard about before. Wiki sticks are little yarn, and they're wax covered, bendable, flexible, sticky sticks that usually you will use for fine motor activities. You can see in the picture, the child is tracing letters using the wiki sticks. They're moldable and they'll stick to the paper. Well, I like to use wiki sticks with my iPad because sometimes there's, there's no buttons on the iPad. So if you're working with a student that needs some tactile feedback, maybe they're visually impaired, 
you can easily take a wiki stick and make it the shape of the square or a circle, whatever shape that you're trying for them to activate, and now you've provided a tactile button for your screen. Real simple and easy to do, and the nice thing about the wiki sticks is they'll just peel off. They leave a slight stickiness on the screen. You can just wipe it off with a tissue or even a little instant hand sanitizer or screen cleaner. So the wiki sticks make great for key guards or kind of a tactile button, especially if you're working with someone that has low vision and needs some tactile feedback. And the final simple solution I want to show you is a PVC pipe T. You can get these at Home Depot or Lowe's, um, but these, this is the connector where you join three pipes of PVC pipe, but I like to use these as a type of grasp for your stylus. And as you'll notice in the picture, they're actually using it to activate a, a dedicated device, a Dynavox, but you definitely could do this with an iPad as well. But it would be really important to use an iPad stylus that's aluminum the whole way, because you have to have that capacitativeness. But then you can just use some Play-Doh or a sponge right here in the circle of your T to hold your stylus, and then the student could use the stylus to activate it. So if they can't make the standard pincer grasp that we use with holding a stylus, this may be a great option. These teas cost about a dollar a piece at the hardware store. Real simple solution to make access easier. All right, and I think I have a question. Somebody asked me where you can purchase wiki sticks at. Well, believe it or not, a couple of years ago you could actually get them in the kids' meals of Zaxby's, but um, you can get them in the craft section of lots of different stores, like craft stores such as Hobby Lobby or Walmart. Um, I recently ordered some online, and they were the Easter packs, so we got about eight wiki sticks, and I got about 50 sets of them for about $20. So you can also order them online, and they're very inexpensive. If you go to Walmart, they're going to probably be about $5, and you probably get a set of about 20 Okay. All right. Well, let's talk now a little bit about some iOS settings. And I'm actually going to go ahead and pull my iPad up um, on my screen, so you'll see some of the options on the iPad. Um, and remember, this is for iOS 7, so if you have an iPad 1 that doesn't have any cameras, you can't have iOS 7. Um, and then again, iOS 8 will be coming out next week, and I'm not sure exactly what some of those changes will be. We're all excited and anxious to see. Um, hopefully, they'll keep some of these great accessibility features, and they'll hopefully have added some more as well. Just give me one second, and I will go ahead and show you my iPad. All right, well, I'm going to show you some iOS 7 features in the iPad. So now you can see my iPad on the screen, and I'm going to move one thing real fast. And I'm going to start by clicking on Settings. This is not an app. This is already built into your operating system. You don't have to worry about it. So under Settings, and then I'm going to go to General, and now there's the tab for Accessibility. So when we start at the top of accessibility, there are things such as voiceover. This is designed for individuals who are hearing impaired or visually, I'm sorry, not hearing impaired, for individuals that are visually impaired or blind. And what happens is it reads everything on the screen. A fair warning, if you do use voiceover, it changes your gestures. So instead of single swiping, you have to double swipe. You have to use two, three fingers instead of one finger. So it's a little tricky. Um, there are apps actually to teach you how to use that. There's also a zoom feature that makes things bigger. Sorry about that. And then um, you can invert colors to make it visually easier to see. The biggest thing that I like to use under vision is the speak selection. So I have mine turned on. I can speed up and slow down the voice. There's minimal voice choices as far as the English language. Um, and you can always pick another language. But what's nice about speak selection, there you see I also have it highlight words. What's nice about this is I can open up Safari, my, my email, um, notes, various things on the iPad, and then if I just hold my finger down, it will highlight the text, and now it gives me the option to speak. And what's nice about this, it will actually speak my text aloud. 
Abraham Lincoln was the 16th President of the United States, serving from March 1861 until his assassination in April 1865. Wikipedia. So this setting in your accessibilities is wonderful if you have a student that has a learning disability or dyslexia and they need text let aloud, or someone maybe that's an English language learner and they're trying to learn English, you can put them on a website and let them listen to different things. So that's a great feature just built in within your accessibility. So I'm going to go back to my settings now, and I'm still in accessibility. We can scroll down. You have a more vision support, such as larger text, bold text, button shapes, um, increased contrast, reduced motion on and off. There's also some accessibility features for hearing. You scroll just a little further down, there is something called guided access. This is one of the best features on accessibility, and this is great because it will let you lock an app. So as you can see, my guided access is turned on. And I'm going to check something real fast, okay? And I'm just going to open up one of my fun apps. I'm just going to open up Virtual Pond. I love this. It's very motivating for students. If you're working with students with sensory issues that are hesitant to try, it kind of feels like a fish pond when you touch it. You might hear some of the fish noises. It kind of sounds like water when you touch the screen. Well, within guided access, now that I've turned it on, any app that I'm using, I triple click, and now it says Guided Access Started. What's nice about Guided Access is I cannot leave this app. I can't close it. I can't turn it off. I can't even turn the volume on. I really can only interact with this app. So if you're using an, AAC, um, an iPad as an AAC device with a communication app such as Proloquo or Sonoflex, Dictable, Lamp, once that app is open, you can lock it to prevent that student from using any other apps. So it's really important. It's a great feature. Now to get out of guided access, you just triple click the home button, and it's going to ask you for a passcode. You're not seeing it on the screen, but I have a passcode. There it is. It's just a little bit delayed. And this is my guided access menu. Now for my occupational therapist, I love this about guided access because if you have a student that's not crossing midline and maybe they're right-handed and you want them to use the left side of the screen more, I can actually draw a box around the right side of the screen. As you can see, I'm not a perfect drawer and I can readjust it. And then I'll hit resume. And if you'll notice, I'm going to attempt to touch the right side of the screen. See that fish coming? I'm going to try to scare him away. Well, nothing happens when I touch the right side of the screen where that grayed circle is because of guided access. Now, if I cross over, as soon as I get outside of that gray circle, and it's kind of hard for you to see, but I'm touching right in here. But when I touch over here, nothing happens because it's blocked. So I'm going to triple click to get out of that. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and end that. Now here's another trick. If you're like me, I love free apps, but one of the problems with the free apps is there's often commercials on the bottom. Let me think, see if I can find one of my favorite free apps. Well, for example, four in a row. What will happen is on the bottom, you see there's that commercial for goldfish slots. Now, because it's a free app, you get what you pay for, they're going to put advertisements in there to make money. But I hate it because my students will accidentally hit down here. Well, I'll use the same principle, triple click, and now I can block it. I'm going to draw that box right around there. So there's my box. Now the student can't touch in that. They're still going to see it, but when they touch it, nothing will happen. Now I didn't hit save, so that's why it blocked it out. Um, start. See, I'm touching and nothing happens. So it's great because it can block those ads. You don't have to worry about the student accidentally going to a commercial. And what's nice, too, about guided access is once you have it, it remembers it for the app. So if I went to another app and came back to that one, 
the block doubt would stay there. So it's very helpful. Now, the next cool thing about iPads is switch control. Now, first and foremost, I will warn you, never turn on switch control. I've played with switch control lots of times, and I have blocked myself out my iPad lots of times. So instead of turning it on here, this is our tool, switch control menu, I turn it on by scrolling down and see where it says accessibility shortcut at the bottom of the page. It's set for guided access because guided access is turned on. I'm going to actually choose switch control and never, switch control needs to be the only thing on. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off guided access. Okay. And now I can go into my switch controls and make my changes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about switch interfaces in a few minutes, but this is the menu where you can make some changes, um, and it will show you how to do your switch scanning. But what's nice about the iPad so iOS 7 is you don't even have to have a switch. If you'll notice, I have three switches picked. And the nice thing about the iPad is your screen can be a switch, or you can use an external switch, which you have to have a switch interface for, or you can use the camera, and the way the camera works is it works with a left head movement or a right head movement. So if you have a student that has good head control and needs switch scanning with the iPad, they could essentially use their head for their scanning. Um, it's a little difficult, and it's really important to have your iPad or your iPod touch your iPhone mount it well um, in a good position because that can quickly um, become out of focus and be hard to use. I'm actually going to go ahead and delete my other ones just so we can show you what this looks like. Now remember I have this on my accessibility shortcut, not turned on because if it's turned on you'll get yourself locked out. So see it still says it's off, there's no green button, but under accessibility shortcut it's switch control. I'm just going to exit this to access your switch, your um, accessibility shortcut, you triple click your home button. So I'm going to triple click one, two, three. And then switch control is going to stop and I'm just going to hit anywhere on my screen. And that will start my switch scanning. It's not like in my screen right now. Let me double check and make sure I have that as a switch. And what I also need to do is make sure my auto scan is on so it's turned off. That's why it wasn't doing anything. Auto scanning means I just have one switch and it will make choices for me. You'll see what that looks like now. Now I could spend... So let's try I wanted to open writing. Writing folder. Writing. Dictation to swipe. Dictation. So again, I just triple click to quickly exit that. Um, there are some wonderful YouTube videos as well as a cheat sheet for switch control. If you turn in your handout on page three, um, I have a link for AbleNet um, and for YouTube. And AbleNet has a great iOS user guide for switch access as well as there's a great YouTube video. So if you have a student that needs switch access, We'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. It is built into the iOS 7 operating system. This is not something that's native to Android or Kindle Fire devices, um, but it's a great way to have access and it's already built in. Um, keeping going on down the menu, you also have something that's called assistive touch. Now what assistive touch does is when you turn it on, you're going to see this little black button appear, this little white button in a black square. You can move it anywhere in the screen. And what happens is when you touch the center, it will bring up a menu of options. Well, if you think about it, if you're working with a student that can't lift the iPad, they can't shake it, they can't touch the buttons on the side, maybe they're using a stylus or a mouth stick, this lets them do any hardware movement that they would need to do with the iPad by just single touch. So like if I click device, it will let me rotate the screen. So maybe I want to rotate it left. Maybe I want to rotate it right. Um, maybe I want to put it upside down. Now I'm doing all of this and you're seeing it adjust on my computer screen, but I'm not moving the iPad. Um, this is strictly by one touch using this assistive touch button. You can customize what's on that button. 
There's favorite fe features, so if you need to pinch or swipe, it will do that for you. Um, it will do multitasking. I even have it so it will draw my name. So there's lots of great things you can do and explore multitasking, assistive touch within that. So that's a great option. Um, another thing to help with physical control is that home click speed. When you have to double click to close apps or when you have to triple click to use an accessibility shortcut, you can change the speed so you don't have to be super fast or super slow. So that's just some of the accessibility features. And we'll talk a little bit more about switch control in a moment. Um, I'm going back to my general settings menu. There's a couple things you may also want to consider to make your iPad more accessible. The first thing is the multitasking gestures. You'll notice mine. I turn it off. Um, multitasking gestures that you quickly swap between apps. What I find is when I'm working with younger students, they'll accidentally have multiple fingers on the iPad and all of a sudden they'll be in an app and they didn't mean to be. Um, so I generally turn those off just because students aren't familiar with that. I am going to go ahead and turn off my physical touch, my assistive touch, so we don't have that on our screen anymore. Sorry about that. Now if I scroll down a little bit more, you have a use a side switch. There's the little side switch on the side of the iPad. Um, on the phone, it automatically mutes it. There's not an option to change it. But on the iPad, you may find it's easier to use this for lock rotation. Think about if you're using the communication device and you're pl playing on the floor. The student may be laying on their belly or their side, and if the iPad is one direction, it may automatically flip and become annoying that, oh, i got to swap the iPad and rotate it around. So I use it and lock rotation as my side switch. I get it either horizontal or vertical. I put the lock rotation in, and that allows me to prevent it from rotating. Especially helpful for those students that are not in a typical position. Maybe they're a little sideways. They're not sitting up straight. Um, you also may want to check out your restrictions. Um, I know I have students that are obsessed with the camera on the iPad, so I will often go ahead and just turn it off. So any app requiring the camera would won't show up. Um, it'll still show up like I have the mustache app where you put mustaches on your face. Well, if they open the mustache app, they can't take a picture, so it really doesn't work. Um, or if, but you have to be careful, like if you're using a communication app and you're trying to import the picture, if the camera's turned off, you're not going to be able to take a quick picture of it. But you can quickly turn it back on, just go into restrictions, enable, turn the camera back on, and then you can go ahead and use to take pictures. You may also want to turn off deleting apps so the student can't accidentally delete an app. And the big one is turn off in-app purchases so they can't accidentally buy things. So there's a lot of different things under restrictions to explore to make the iPad more accessible. And one more thing under general, if you scroll down, there's keyboards. Now I do know this is a big change coming in iOS 8. Um, in, IO, in iOS 7, you only have one keyboard. You have the English keyboard. And I've actually added the emoji keyboard so I can make faces. Well, in the new iOS 8, you'll be able to add additional keyboards for more accessibility. So um, more for phonetic spelling, um, some more for high speed typing. So there'll be some interesting new keyboards come in, which will be very helpful for some of our students. But you can also split the keyboard. So if you ever pull up the keyboard, you can split it. Um, and what I like to do is the shortcuts. So as you see, I have a Go Gator shortcut. Um, or if I'm typing my name and I don't want to type my whole name, I just type LP and it types in Laura Parks. So you can quickly add a shortcut. So it's great for a student that's a reluctant writer and they're trying to write a report and it's too many letters. You can let them create their own shortcut. So it's a fun, easy thing to do. All right, so that's just a little bit about the iPad accessibility features and things you may change in the settings. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint now and we'll come back to the iPad in a few minutes. Are there any questions about the iOS accessibility settings before we continue? Feel free to raise your hand or you can type it in the chat box. All right, I had someone ask a little bit about the switch control. Um, like I said, I will go in that a little bit further in a minute. Um, but the switch control is a great option. I have a client that uses a single switch um, by blinking his eye, and he can control the entire iPad. So it's great to know that there's an option. No, unfortunately, there's no eye gaze yet. We kind of were hoping with iOS 8 maybe they would come out with it. Um, I haven't heard anything about confirming that rumor, so I don't think that happened. Um, but we will see when iOS 8 comes out in the middle of September. Um, one more question about the restrictions. 
No, unfortunately, somebody asked if in the restrictions could you restrict specific apps. Unfortunately not. Um, that is something that is available on certain um, Android devices, and it's something that Kindle Fire touts, that you can have apps that only certain users can use, or at certain times they can use it. So let's say you had a student that was using a communication app, but you wanted them to have the opportunity to have a fun app, but you only want them to do it, let's say, from 2 to 3. Well, unfortunately, iOS 7 does not have that restrictions option. You can't hide those apps. What I generally do, if you'll notice on my iPad, and I'll bring my iPad up just for a minute so you can see that. What I generally do, well, I teach the behavior to the children, and I explain that I expect maybe at first these are the apps that the student has to do first, and then maybe once they're done, then they can do a fun app. And the fun apps may be up here, or I may have them docked down here. Um, I can also move my apps into specific students folder. So I may have a student folder for Laura, a student folder for John, and move apps into there. But again, one of the limitations with the iPad at iOS 7 is you can't put the app in multiple folders. So if Laura and John were doing the exact same apps, I can't put them together. But maybe that's when I would dock it down here in the bottom. So that's just how I kind of handle that, and that is a restriction option many of us would love to see to be ability to block apps at certain times. Good question. All right, we're going to go ahead and go on to talk a little bit more now about cases. It's really important when you're thinking about using a tablet, especially if you're using it for a communication device, is it needs to be portable and fairly durable as well. Um, we've all seen people with shattered screens on their, their phones. Um, the important thing is you're going to find a case that has a nice bumper around the outside of the, the cover. Because what, when the iPad or the, the device you're using goes face down, which inevitably it will, you want to make sure the glass is not what, hit, what hits the ground. Um, this Big Grips case is one example of that. It is a little childish, so if you're working with a teenager, you probably don't want this type of case. But it is nice and lightweight, um, and it's foamy, and it's easy to hold, and it's very durable in case it does do a face plant. Now, the um, another case you may want is like the OtterBox, these heavy-duty ones. What I find is sometimes they're bulky, um, and they add some weight to it, which can actually deter some students from holding it. And there's a lot of not... Um, not so much customization when it comes to otter boxes. There's a couple of colors to choose from. I know when I purchased my personal cell phone cover, I didn't go with an otter box because I didn't like the color choices. A communication device, if you're using an iPad or a tablet for a communication device, it's very personable. We want them, the student, the person using it to feel like it's a part of them, let them customize it. So you may find that sometimes these cases even dictate, well, I'm going to get a case because I know that's their favorite color or they're more likely to use it. There are also cases that have built-in handles, like the AMDI's eye adapter. What's nice about it, it has a nice hard plastic handle, all built-in, and then it actually has a built-in speaker. Um, some of the problems we've run into with using iPads or tablets for communication devices is they're too soft. So having a built-in speaker or a Bluetooth speaker can help with that. And some of the cases now do cover with that. Um, there's all kinds of cases available, but like I said, you want really to consider, well, who's using it, their personality, and how transportable is it. Um, we've gotten some great, um, actually, Amazon, if you go to our Amazon link, we've got a great outer box case now that actually has a handle built in, which is kind of nice. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on and talk now a little bit about styluses. Now, the styluses must be capacitative. Um, if you happen to go into a store, you can't use Nintendo DS stylus or just a pen or a pencil because they're not capacitative. Those work for pressure. The harder you push, it activates it. But remember, the iPad and most tablets now are capacitative, meaning it has to make a current. You have your standard styluses that you can get really cheap. Um, they also make a great triangle-shaped stylus for our OT friends that love to recommend handwriting without tears. Um, it just kind of promotes a more natural grasp. They do make a great one. Um, they make small ones. Uh, I love this crown-shaped one. And I love about this one is it's rubber all the way through, so you don't have to worry about if the tip falls off, because I know some of these styluses, like this pencil one down here and this ergonomic one, um, it, sometimes that little rubber tip falls off and then you're left with metal and that scratches the screen. This crown shaped one, and again we got this one from Amazon or I found them at Walgreens before, it's rubber all the way through and you don't have to worry about the student scratching the screen. Um, this little one on this finger up here is a stylus worm and 
got it from Amazon. What's nice about this, it wraps around the student's finger. So let's say a student has poor grasping ability, this one will stay on their finger. You don't have to worry about having a splint and connecting that with them. Now these are a little more specialized. You know, the, these on this screen you can buy from most vendors of um, iPad accessories or online like at Amazon. These are a little more specialized now, but remember, think back, this T-stylus I showed you earlier using a PVC pipe. Well, down here you see there's one of a um, lady holding one, and she has a kind of like a little wood dowel rod, and then it has an aluminum, that's what makes it capacitative, little aluminum stick, and it has this little soft, um, it's called a, a little sock is what they call it, and it has some aluminum thread built, some silver thread in that sock, which makes it capacitative. So there's a T-stylus. Um, I love this flexible stylus. We do have this in our lending library. I can actually bend and shape this however I need to to hold on to that student's hand. So if you're used to working with the occupational therapist who's trying to use a splint to have a student be able to hold something in their hand, now you don't need the splint, you just actually shape the stylus to the hand. I see a question. Um, someone asked how expensive it is. Now the flexible stylus, we purchased ours through Etsy. Um, and it's about $50. The vendor is called Shape Dad. So it is a little bit costly. But I'm going to encourage you to use our lending library. It's on the bottom of your handout, al for Alabama, dot at for all dot com. Just choose the program as task, and you'll see that um, in our lending library. You can borrow it for free. It's easy to mail back and forth. Um, so if you'd like to try that, let us know. They also do make mouth sticks for the iPad. This is a dignity thing. You, you want to make sure that the student or the adult you're working with is okay with using a mouth stick. It just has a little wing bite that goes in the student's mouth, and then they can control the longer stylus and activate the screen, kind of like the beef jerky stick. Um, and we've actually purchased some conductive fabric um, from Sparks, and that will let us make our own styluses using this fabric. We can cover whatever we want. But the trick is the fabric or the aluminum has to be touching the hand to make that electricity, the capacitativeness. Because we just use metal, it won't work. So those are just some styluses. And styluses are great, um, if you're, especially if you're using it like for a communication app because you want to increase accuracy. Um, they can make it difficult if that communication app does require swiping, though, because sometimes swiping with a stylus can be a little difficult. Now, positioning your iPad or tablet is really important because that's for the best access. Just like when we do dedicated communication devices, we think about, well, is the student in a wheelchair? Are they sitting at a table? Um, how can they access that device? What positioning? Key, 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 really, really important. I'll probably say this a couple times. When you're looking at a mount to position your iPad, you want one that has the iPad in a case. I have seen a lots of my individuals I've worked with that have a wheelchair mount for their iPad and they take the doorway and they hit their doorway with their wheelchair and the iPad falls off the mount. It will happen. Well, if that iPad's not in a case, it will shatter. So we want to make sure that the mount allows for a case. So I'm showing you a couple that don't. These three don't have a protective case on the iPads. So I would avoid using those. Now, I do love me a sea sucker, and it works great. But you want to be careful, because it doesn't have that protective case. Here you see RJ Cooper's table mount for the iPad. And I have it in my Big Grips case, which is actually what my iPad is in right now. So it holds it nicely. So I don't have to worry about if the mount falls over, gets knocked down. It's not going to hurt the iPad. Now, when we think about mounts, too, we want to think about how the arm works as far as the positioning. Um, you can get some that have the joints, like right here. The top one on the left, you see, has a joint with a handle, and they can loosen that, and that will let us reposition the iPad. Um, they also make goosenecks, so you see a gooseneck one here, and the sea sucker one down here is also a gooseneck. Um, and this allows you to position the iPad a little bit easier than using the joints. Um, and it's also helpful if you have a student that has a seizure disorder. You want them, in case they fall into the iPad, you want the iPad to give away. You don't want it to break the mount or for them to hurt themselves by face planting into the iPad. One of my favorite new mounts that I found recently is just this pillow top. Um, this is great. It just sits on your lap and you hold the iPad. So if a student is laying on the floor or sitting in crisscrossed applesauce on the floor, they can hold the iPad and it keeps them in position. And even in the iPad in a mount it will, or in a case, it fits nicely. It gives you just some options. Again, we have several in our lending library. Feel free if you ever need to borrow one. Now remember earlier we talked about wiki sticks being used as a key guard. 
Now, if you're familiar with AAC devices and dedicated devices, key guards are something we've always talked about when we're considering what the device a child needs, because this provides buttons onto a touch screen, as well as it provides and it can help increase accuracy. And the nice thing about key cards for iPads is they're pretty cheap. They're about $15 to $20 a piece. Um, and the only bad thing is, first, you can't really swipe when you're using a key card. And the second thing is it's specific to the app. So if you're using, for example, LAMP, which really builds on motor memory, the buttons are always the same, um, you'll have a key card for LAMP. But if you're using, for example, another communication app, such as Sounding Board, you would have a different key card for that. Um, the key guards just suction on or fit underneath the case, um, but they're a great thing to help with accuracy to improve um, your access to that device. Um, and again, I provided several vendors on the handout so that you can um, check them out to see. They're relatively inexpensive, but very important to improve accuracy. Now, we've talked briefly now about switch access. So a year ago when iOS 7 came out, switch access was built in, and we were all thrilled because it really was a game changer. But there's some things you should know about switch access. The first, we talked a little bit about the switch itself. Yes, you can use the screen as a switch, or you could use your head movement as a switch, although it's a little bit difficult sometimes. You can also get switch interfaces. Just like with a computer, you can't plug in a switch directly into the iPad. You have to have some kind of switch interface. So um, RJ Cooper makes one, Inclusive, AbleNet. What's really cool, and this is what I think is amazing. See this one down here on the right? This is I actually purchased at my local music store that sold guitar accessories. This is a page turner. It's designed to be used for individuals playing their guitar and using their iPad to look at the sheet music. Of course, you're playing the guitar, you don't have a free hand, so what you would do is you would step on the pedal, the left pedal, to go back, or the right pedal to turn the page. How fun is that? Well, believe it or not, if I unplug the pedals, this is a 1 8 mono audio adapter meaning I can plug in any capability switch to this guitar switch interface. And I didn't specially orderize this. I just went to my local guitar store and I purchased that. How cool is it to think that we're living in a time when an individual with significant motor impairment could actually go to Walmart, buy their iPad, go to a music store, and buy this switch interface for about 150 bucks and be ready to go and not have to buy something from a special needs catalog. I just get goosebumps when I think about that because we really have come to a great age of universal design. So those are all types of switch interfaces. Now the guitar one, as well as all the ones pictured here, work on Bluetooth. And you know sometimes Bluetooth can be a little bit finicky. You have to turn it off and on and it will run your batteries down. Um, and basically the the iPad, these are sending specific keystrokes to the iPad. Now, there are several ones now that do plug straight into the little USB or to your Fire. Um, I've listed those on yours, like Tapio from Origin is one example, um, and I know there's another one from Tesla that you can actually plug them in. So once you have a switch interface, you're good to go, right? Only if it was that easy. Unfortunately, it's not. One of the things that's a little tricky about switch access is, yes, the iPad is fully switch accessible. I can start switch scanning, I can open any app I want, I can do Safari, I can do notes, and I can type. But the problem is not all developers are making their apps accessible. The same thing is true with voiceover for the blind. It's true with switch access. The developers just aren't aware of the easy steps it is to make their app more accessible. Um, so I have one of my client who uses the iPad with switch access, he finds that certain apps just don't work so well, like Facebook, forget it, it's too much trouble to use the Facebook app. Now if he goes to Safari and goes to Facebook.com, he can access it beautifully because Safari was built with accessibility in mind, but the Facebook app is not as easy to use. So there are some tricks because not all apps are accessible. Another thing to consider, and I have this available on your handout, um, there's a website by Jane Farrell, and it's a bit.ly, bit.ly slash switches, switch apps. Um, this is a great website, Jane Farrell, because what she does is she takes apps that have been designed with switch accessibility in mind, and she tells you which switch interface works. Now, any switch interface will work for the iOS operating system switch access. So, 
because what happens is when you turn on, and I'll go back and show you for example, when you actually go into your settings for turning on switch, remember we're never going to turn it on, we're going to do the triple click, but I'm going to show you real fast. I'm going to go back into my settings and back to accessibility and back here to switch X control. And when I do switches, if I wanted to add a new switch and I go external, what I would do is I would have my switch interface connected and I would hit the switch button. And as soon as I hit the switch button, the iPad would tell me what do you want to name this button and what does this button do. So it's really helpful and it's super easy. And you'll see that if you watch that YouTube video from AbleNet. Um, it really walks you through how to turn this off and on and use it effectively. Well, the problem is for some of these switch accessible apps, they're expecting a specific keystroke. Now, if you've used switch interfaces with computers before, you know often you have the option to change it. You can make it a space bar, a left click, and enter. Well, the same thing is true with the switch interfaces for the iPads. You know, each one sends a specific signal to the iPad. Now, if you'll notice on this inclusive one, the Persarian, I might not have said that correctly, but it has four different lights. And then if you'll notice right here, there's a little LCD screen. Well, this means I can actually tell what I want four different switches to do. And then it will do, if I flip the box over, it will tell you what each function is. So I can actually do multiple functions, just like with some of those fancy computer interfaces. I can tell exactly what the keystroke is. Certain apps require certain keystrokes. Maybe it's a one, maybe it's a space, maybe it's a left or a right enter. Not all switch interfaces do the same thing. That's right, it's really important if you're using Switch users to go to Jane Farrell's site because she's the most comprehensive one that I've found. She compares all of those Switch accessible apps and she tells you, well, which Switch interface will work with it. Again, I keep saying about our lending library, but it's so important because it can get frustrating when you're doing assistive technology if you're buying stuff all the time and it doesn't work. Please borrow it from us first. We can, you can try it risk-free and to see if it really will meet your needs or if it will meet your app needs for the apps that you're trying to use. So that's just a little bit about the switch access. And finally, I do want to talk about environmental control briefly. Um, environmental control is a great thing to have if you have a physical impairment and you want to be able to control your environment. This is something that's continuing to increase in the marketplace um, because lots of individuals think it's fun to use their iPads or their um, iPhones to control things. Perhaps you listen to the radio and you've heard a commercial for some of the heating and air companies are giving away a free iPad when you get a new heating and air system because their, their thermostat is now controllable by your environment. Well, that's great for us that, you know, want to be able to turn our heat up and down when we're at work or if we're in bed and we're too lazy to get out. But what if you have a spinal cord injury and you're in a wheelchair and you can't reach the thermostat? Um, or if it's in another room and you can't get to it? Well, that's the beauty of um, universal design within environmental control. We're seeing it in the everybody wants it, but it really benefits our individuals with physical impairments. So we've explored some different environmental control units for our lending library here. Um, this is just a power strip from Quirky. You can purchase it at Home Depot for about 50 bucks. Um, or lows, and you can turn on and on two different power source, two different of the outlets. I like the Belkin one a little bit better. Unfortunately, neither one of these is switch is switch accessible. So, or or it is of date. I haven't checked for the updates lately, but maybe now that they've listened and they've updated it and made it more accessible. But it would work just fine if you can touch. But if you're trying to use switch control, not so much. Um, the Belkin's kind of nice because you just plug it in. And then you plug whatever device in, and it turns off and on. It tends to be a little more, a little faster than the Quirky is, um, but the Belkin um, is awesome. And that's called the Wemo. And then there are also these great infrared devices. So if you're trying to control an infrared device, such as a TV, a stereo, this little box will take your infrared, and you can send it through your phone, it's Bluetooth, and it Bluetooth commands to this, and then the infrared goes from here to your device which you're trying to use. So environmental control is, is possible with 
um, using a device. The reason I talk about environmental control even to my speech therapist is because it's a great way to teach cause and effect. You can let the student turn off and on a light, turn off and on a fan. Um, we even do some toys around here with the plug-in toys. Um, it's just a fun way to practice access because it gets them to do swiping or it gets them to do touching and it gets them to be in control of their environment. It's just a lot of fun. So that's just a little bit, and I'm just going to backtrack real fast to our overview page. Um, so we've talked about lots of different things today um, in this eye access training, and hopefully you understand the importance of being able to access a tablet or an iPad. Um, some things from the simple solutions like the Ziploc bag um, and the wiki sticks to the amazing settings in iOS 7, and like I said, be aware of iOS 8 when it's released in the middle of September. There may be some more accessibility or some differences. We'll keep you updated. Um, the importance of cases, that portability of the iPad and protecting it, because you don't want to invest in an iPad and the communication app for it just to be broken and still the child's not able to communicate. If they're supposed to be using this device to communicate, we don't want it to be broken. Also, the styluses can help with accessing the device, positioning and mountings with the different wheelchair mounts and table mounts that are available, key guards to improve access, although we could fake it with a wiki stick, um, and then switch access. And switch access, please don't be scared of it. It's a great tool. It's amazing that it's already built into the iPad, but definitely watch those two videos. The video I provided the link on the handout, as well as look at the PDF from AbleNet because that will really help you. And finally, environmental control with the iPad. This is just something that's going to get more increased in the future and hopefully they'll continue to think about accessibility and making it accessible with switches and voiceover. Um, and it's just something that we're going to see more and more in everyday life and that will help our individuals with disabilities. Um, are there any more questions at this time? Feel free to raise your hand or to type it in the chat box. Um, I had a question about switch control. Yes, with switch control you can use any capability switch because those switch interfaces have the all standard that one eighth mono audio adapter. So any, like even the guitar one, yeah. You just plug your capability switch into it and then you can use it. A question about mounts. Yes, mounts t can be kind of expensive. Um, they range in price anywhere, um, you know, if you're going to get the, the foam one, that's about $20. Um, or if you're going to look at more like a wheelchair mount, either the lock line, the gooseneck one, or the with the levers, they are going to be about $300. Okay. I have another question. Um, is insurance paying for iPads for communication devices? At this time in Alabama, they are not. Um, there has been some states that have started to consider using the iPad as a communication device, um, and certain vendors are packaging iPads with an app, um, with a case, and with a mount all in one, and then selling it to insurances. Um, that is something Alabama is considering, and I think it will happen. Some of the concerns are, what about repairs? Who's going to cover that? Um, what about development? Because when we do the apps, the prices and, you know, when the updates, because we think about the iPads, they're relatively new still, and you, most devices we don't upgrade until five to seven years, and the iPad really needs to be updated from two to three years. So if we let insurance start covering the devices, such as an iPad, will they replace it at three to five years? We're not sure about that. So those are some questions we're not sure. But they may or may not start covering it in the future. We just don't know. As a follow-up, uh, the speech therapist wrote, but the copay is still cheaper for an iPad than it is for a dedicated device. That is true. Most insurances require 20% um, if such as private insurance. Now, Medicaid still covers 100% in Alabama, but if you're having a private insurance or Medicare, it's probably a 20% copay, so you could be looking at a two to $3,000 copay, which would be cheaper than an iPad, which is still more expensive than an iPad and amount in the app itself. Somebody asked a specific question about apps. Um, we're, I really uh, would be happy to share additional information about apps. Um, this training was really designed just for access, so we really weren't going to explore apps. But look for future trainings on apps, as well as like language and reading apps. And um, on our startraining.org website, we have links to additional apps and some great websites and apps that we use to find additional apps. 
All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this webinar up. Um, I will stick around for a minute. If you have any more questions, feel free to raise your hand or to type it in the chat. And I do ask when you leave the webinar to please fill out the survey. This will help us with federal funding. And we will be contacting the participants with a follow-up survey required for ASHA in order to provide an ASHA certificate of completion. But thank you for joining us.